Every day, scientists are learning more and more about how human brains work and how many of us don't fit into the old-fashioned understanding of how brains should work. But a lot of ideas about parenting and familial relationships still need to catch up to the reality of human variation. Neurological differences are natural, profoundly valuable parts of being in a community together and in being part of a family. Whoever you are, wherever you are in your journey, I am here to explore with you. We are all in this together. Welcome to Neurodiverging. Today, I want to talk to you about race and ADHD. I've been researching this since the beginning of the year because it's really, really important. And I don't think people talk about the intersection between neurodivergence and race often enough. The stereotype of ADHD that almost everyone thinks about is like a young, rambunctious, hyperactive little white boy running around, right? But the truth is that people of all backgrounds ethnicities, cultures, races, all people have ADHD at about the same rates. About five to 10% of everybody on this planet has ADHD or is an ADHD brain. And those rates don't differ between black, white, or Hispanic populations. However, it is true that ADHD is diagnosed differently in white families than it is in black or Hispanic families. There are a lot of reasons for this, and some of them are very complicated. Some boil down to just racism. But it's important to talk about these issues because the more people that are aware that they exist, the more we can work together to create more equity in diagnosis and treatment and support of people with ADHD brains. Because of the complexity of this topic, we're splitting this discussion up into a couple of episodes so that we can dig a little deeper into different aspects of ADHD and race. Today, I want to talk about one of the ways that children don't get access to evaluation or aren't recognized as ADHD in our school systems. I am specifically talking about American school and the American school system because that's what I'm most familiar with, living in America and being an American. I would be surprised, though, if some of these issues at least weren't represented in other school systems in other places as well. So let me just start with one factoid for you. Only 18% of teachers in the United States are people of color, 18%. That means that 82% of teachers in the United States are white people. That means the vast majority of students are being taught by someone from outside their own racial or ethnic background, someone who may not be culturally competent in their milieu. Additionally, the large majority of white teachers will be racist teachers. Now, most teachers are doing their best for their kids with very limited resources, little pay, low support from their administrators and their community, and lots of other roadblocks. And we're gonna get into that more in a couple of minutes. So don't think I'm ragging on teachers. That said, teachers are just as likely to display race bias as anybody else in the world and are just as likely to suffer from a set of implicit biases as anybody else. What I mean by that is that even people who are awake to racism who are doing the active work to become less racist still have a set of internalized biases or assumptions that they make about people based on the color of their skin, their ethnicity, or their culture. If they are doing the work, they will have recognized some of them, but probably not all of them and probably not all the time. Teaching is stressful, it's hard, Often decisions about discipline in the classroom are made really quickly and without much time to reflect. You're just trying to like get the kids to calm down, chill out, do their work, right? So you don't necessarily as a teacher have a lot of time to be able to think through what's happening and why. And teachers, because they don't have that time to reflect, are less likely to be able to recognize when they're making a racist assumption or decision. Now, given that teachers are supposed to educate our children, teach them critical thinking skills, provide basic social skills to them, provide emotional counseling to them, on top of creating lessons and being in correspondence with various therapists, social workers, co-teachers, aides, going to meetings with parents, all this work that we give to teachers with no time to do it in, 
Given all this, we are also expecting teachers to be the frontline workers for noticing when a child is struggling. And not only to notice, but to have the wherewithal and the resources to report it to parents or other professionals to get assistance for that child. In a school with mostly high achieving kids, a child with behavior or attention problems will be conspicuous, stand out, see them right away. Teachers can get on that. But in poorer schools, those that are overcrowded, don't have enough staff, are not performing as well, and so don't get the funds they need, a similarly struggling child won't be as obvious. And in a crowded, underfunded room with 30 kids and one teacher who maybe only started teaching a year or two ago, that is a big ask. Those teachers are not in a place where they can get kids with ADHD any help or sometimes even recognize it. Now, in order for a teacher to suspect that ADHD is part of the reason a student is struggling, Obviously, the teacher must have been educated in what ADHD looks like at different ages, in different racial ethnic groups, in different situations and environments, and they need to be educated enough that they can then pick it out among other discipline or social issues that are coming in between students in the classroom. So I am not ADHD myself, I am autistic. I have a partner and one child who are ADHD. So. Without being ADHD myself, I would still say that I'm relatively familiar with it and what it looks like from the outside as an outside observer. And even given that, even raising a kiddo with ADHD, and my partner and I have been together for 10 years, even given all those background resources, the reading I've done, I still sometimes have trouble identifying behaviors that ADHD or even remembering that certain issues are caused by ADHD traits. So if a teacher in a busy classroom is seeing a child with a lot of impulse control issues, who isn't listening to directions, who's constantly distracted or falling asleep, somebody who's pushing, shoving, being violent out of overwhelm or impulse control issues, that teacher might not immediately realize that those issues are indicative of ADHD. Instead, that teacher is more likely to label that child as a problem child as a troublemaker and to assume that the child will never work to expectation in the classroom because the child doesn't listen or doesn't care about the class. Then the child is more likely to be sent to the counselor or the principal's office more often to be suspended, even to be expelled than any other kid without undiagnosed ADHD. Being suspended once or twice even once or twice, especially as a black or Hispanic kid, is highly associated with being involved in the juvenile justice system in the United States. We also know that these kids who don't do well in school and aren't incentivized to stay in school have a much higher risk of ending up incarcerated, jailed. I'm going to link um, in my notes, in my show notes, to one study that you should have a look at. It estimates that up to 40% of people incarcerated in the United States have ADHD. 40% of incarcerated people have ADHD. Considering we have a five to 10% incidence of ADHD in the general population, the fact that an incredible number of ADHD kids are being failed by the school system and the justice system and are ended up incarcerated instead of getting support and help is mind blowing, 40%. So obviously, teachers need more funding, more support, smaller classroom sizes, lots of other things. But we also need some sort of better mechanism in the school systems for recognizing ADHD and referring students for evaluation. Perhaps especially if we're seeing what looks like defiance in the classroom or somebody ending up in the principal's office a lot. Those kids need to have a kind of pathway for being evaluated, either for ADHD or for some other kind of support. Some schools are really great at this, but they are usually schools with a mostly white student body located in more affluent areas. Certainly school systems which are underfunded should not be blamed for not having the resources to recognize their ADHD students and to successfully refer them to better support. That is not the underfunded teachers, principals faults. But then what's to blame? I'll tell you what, it's structural racism. Now, if you're not familiar with structural racism, I highly encourage you to do some additional reading. It's really an important concept, but it's outside the scope of this podcast, and there's so many good resources on it. I don't think I'm the one uh, that should be explaining it necessarily, but basically, for the purposes of right now, structural racism is the existence of discriminatory treatment 
unfair policies, inequitable opportunities and impacts based on race. This discriminatory treatment is made and perpetuated by institutions, structures like schools, churches, laws, the media, newspapers, so forth. And it ensures that black people, indigenous people, and other people of color do not have access to the same power, privilege, and treatment as white people do. That's it, structural racism. There are structures in place that block people of color from accessing things that white people don't even have to think about having trouble accessing. We can see the results of structural racism in the American public school system all over the place. The schools that are least likely to have support structures in place enough school counselors, enough highly educated, highly paid teachers are also the schools most likely to have a higher population of black, Hispanic, and other students of color. Why is this the case? Well, there are a couple of big reasons. First, most states in America rely on a combination of local funding, state funding, and federal funding to get their money for the school system. Most of the local funding from your town that goes to your school is from local property taxes. Okay. Overall, public K through 12, kindergarten through 12th grade schools get 45% of their funding, almost half from local revenues. Poorer communities pay less in local property taxes, which leads to less funding for their school systems. So poorer people send their kids to school. Those kids don't get as good an education as the rich kids. Okay. Second, School districts are mostly drawn by the government. I'm saying districts as in the, the geographical area um, where kids from this geographic area go to this school and kids from this other geographic area go to this other school, right? That's a school district. So most school districts are drawn by the government and are rife with the same racist issues of redlining and gerrymandering as our voting systems are. So if you've read about you know, gerrymandering in states in the United States, the same kind of process happens with school districts as it does with voting districts. Most towns and cities are still highly segregated according to race, with white people living mostly separately from black people. That means that most American public schools are also highly segregated. They have a student population that is either mostly white or mostly brown and black, okay? Even if the town population is integrated, the neighborhoods are segregated, and thus the schools become segregated. Third, in areas that are gentrifying, redlining and gerrymandering can and will change the compositions of neighborhoods. So when new residents come in with more money, the neighborhoods will reorganize themselves, redistrict themselves to favor those people with more money over the existing residents who might have less money, even if they've been there for generations. That means that children from richer families end up in better schools than children from poorer families. One report says, quote, white districts enroll just over 1,500 students, half the size of the national average, and non-white districts serve over 10,000 students, three times more than that average. Poor white school districts receive about $150 less per student than the national average, which is an injustice all to itself. Yet, they are still receiving nearly $1,500 more than poor non-white school districts." End quote. So white students throughout the country are in schools that are 50% smaller with up to 10 times more funding than black students. Half the class size, 10 times more money to teach that class. Knowing that, are we surprised that white children with ADHD are diagnosed more frequently and younger than black and brown kids with ADHD? Are we surprised that white students graduate schools at much higher rates and are incarcerated at much lower rates, right? Even if everything else were equal, which is not. Are we surprised that teachers in rich white schools with more education and more support are also more likely to recognize ADHD in a student when they see it and be able to communicate their suspicions to the student and their parents so they can seek out individualized professional help? No, all of these things are related to race in our towns, in our cities, in our states, in our country, right? As long as racism remains a force in the United States, we will be doing students with ADHD a huge disservice. And this is obviously, I am talking about ADHD in this 
episode, but it doesn't it doesn't not apply to everybody else who's neurodivergent, right? Autistic kids suffer the same way. Kids with um, OCD, kids with food allergies have the same kinds of issues. They're not neurodivergent, right? But any kind of mental health or physical health issue is exacerbated by racism in the schools, right? We really are all in this together. So what are some things you can do to help in your community? One, learn about your local school districts and work to make them more equitable. What is the population of black, white, and Hispanic students in your local schools? Is everyone pretty mixed together or are you seeing segregation? If you have a Hispanic school and a white school, even though the neighborhoods are right next to each other, you're seeing segregation. You're seeing one school probably getting a lot less funding than the other school. You have the opportunity to get in there and make some change. So how were your school districts created? Is the districting fair or just gerrymandering a problem? How is funding obtained and apportioned in your school districts? Do students of color and their teachers have access to the funding that they need? Okay. You, even if you are not a parent, if you are a citizen of your space and you are paying taxes, your money is going towards the school systems. You have an opportunity to make some really significant change at the local level. It is much, much, much easier to change local statutes, local organizations than it is to change federal ones. Everything starts at the bottom, right? So if you have the opportunity, if you notice a problem in um, how, if you're seeing segregation, for example, in your schools, learn about districting, learn about how to get things redistricted, who has the authority, make a fuss, okay? Get some other folks together and make a fuss. School districts, PTAs, um, local governments will hear you. Sometimes um, it's just that nobody's brought their attention to it, which is so sad, but true. Sometimes something has been on the books for years and no one's looked twice at it. And it just takes one person to stand up and be like, I don't think this is really that great to make a huge change. So don't think that you don't have the wherewithal to do this. Okay. It, if everybody just like did it, email your school board, right? Pay attention to when the board meets, attend some meetings if you can. Just try to get in there and figure out, listen to people of color who are going to the schools, listen to the parents of people of color at the schools, and figure out how you can support them in getting their needs met better from the schools, okay? Now, regards ADHD specifically, you can ask things like, what is the school's policy for identifying um, students with ADHD and referring them for help? Does your school have the resources to do that at all? Or are they really understaffed and just don't have anybody who has the education to do it? Um, is there any training for teachers about ADHD? Is the school board willing to fund training? Um, is there a way to fund training from the outside? Is there a, an organization in your community that would donate money for teacher training? Um, is there a professional in your community who can volunteer their time to teachers who want the training? Do teachers have a list of ADHD professionals in the community that they can pass on to parents when an issue comes up? Does that list of ADHD professionals include any folks who are not white? Because that's really important, okay? Um, it is true that most, I think it's like 80% of mental health professionals in the United States are white. But that doesn't mean that no professionals who have experience with ADHD who are not white exist in your town please make an effort to find them or find resources for people of color who are having questions about ADHD and make sure your teachers have that little list so that they can hand it to parents and parents have a way to access people in their own communities who can give them some help, okay? That's culturally competent, culturally sensitive help. Um, another really easy thing you can do is just support legislation that funds education um, especially legislation that is dedicated to making the funding differences between white schools and black schools more equitable. And lastly, I'll just say, please check out the links in the show notes for more reading on this topic and a list of organizations that you can follow and support and get involved with to help schools do a better job for our ADHD students of color. 
Thanks so much for being here with me today on Neurodiverging. In future episodes, we'll be discussing some other facets of ADHD and racial equality, so please stay tuned. The fight for a better world for people with ADHD is inextricably tied to the fight against racism. We all need to do the work together. For more information, you can visit our website at neurodiverging.com.